All right, guys, I'm going to cover the EEG mainly, and then I'm going to throw in a few uh, other neuro things. For example, the Glasgow Coma Scale and Babinski. As a review with your EEG, you're going to have um, basically four general types of waves. Your beta waves are going to be your highest frequency at 14 to 30 hertz and it's going to be your lowest amplitude. So highest frequency, lowest amplitude. Alpha waves, so this is when you're alert, concentrated, exercising, those kind of things. Alpha waves when you're relaxed. Um, one source said during super learning. I don't know what the hell that means. Uh, but the wave, uh, the, the frequency for anyone over 8 years old is 8 to 13 or 8 to 13.9. Uh, below 8 years old it can be different and we'll go through that in a second. So you're going to have the uh, still a, a fairly high frequency and a little bit higher amplitude. Then in your theta waves at 4 to 7 this is going to be your REM sleep. It can also be like really deep meditation, hypnosis, those kind of things. Uh, I'm honestly not sure if I believe in hypnosis, but um, if there is such a thing, this would be a theta wave uh, type of thing. And so there, uh, again, there you see that. And then delta waves, this is your dreamless sleep where you're just completely knocked and conked out. You don't have anything going on in your head as far as dreams. And this is going to be from 0 0.1 up to 3.9 or 0. Point, or from anywhere to almost nothing up to 3. So there's a picture of that. Now I put bat D up here. Bat D representing that it's beta, alpha, theta, and delta. And you can think of that someone's batty whenever they get in a deep sleep. I don't really know if that makes sense, but I'm just coming up with mnemonics here. So let's talk really quick about our patient's EEG findings for this week. It says that they used bipolar montages with additional T1 T2 electrodes. I think this is a probably super low yield, but we'll talk about it anyway. anyways. There was a background of 6 to 7 hertz in the awake state. Amplitude varied from 20 to 100 microvolts. I honestly thought that our patient was in a coma, so I don't... <laughs> I'll just admit there's some confusion on my part here. Nevertheless, I'll explain the finding when we get to it. Myogenic eye movement artifacts. Um, so your, your EEG is picking up the electrical activity of your brain, and you're also going to have electrical activity for muscle movement, and you get artifacts if you move. You're not supposed to move during an EEG reading, but if your eyes move, if you twitch, if your face moves, it's going to pick those things up. So I explained that whole thing already, so when we get to it, we'll just skip it. Stage 1 and 2 of light sleep noted throughout the reading. So this is another thing that kind of, uh, I'm going to admit confusion here. So noted throughout the reading with vertex waves, sleep spindles, and K-complexes. Uh, we also had, uh, what we didn't see was spike in wave activity. Um, we saw poor uh, photic stimulation. Uh, they did not perform hyperventilation, and the interpretation that they gave us was mild encephalopathy. Okay, what was the crap about montages? First of all, it's just a standard of saying, this is how we place the electrodes, this is how we we used um, limb like it's like thinking of EEG. You can have uh, bipolar leads and you can have unipolar leads and all this. It's all technical speak explaining how the leads were placed and what the leads were recording. Look what I said here. Probably not important. And if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> if it is important, I'm sorry. I'm not going to go into it. Not high yield. Okay, so the background, 6 to 7 hertz in the awake state. Yes, I, I am a little bit confused, like I said earlier. Was he awake? Was he in a coma? He had to have been awake or at least had some awake activity. But there is such a thing as like what's called an alpha coma. And I'm not going to get into that super... Uh, uh, I'm not going to get into that at all, except that you should know that sometimes with alpha waves, you can be in a coma. You'll note that this is less than alpha waves. Um, I'll explain that. So what causes EEG slowing? Well, first of all, slowing is caused by decreased consciousness because you get into theta and delta waves. That's decreased consciousness. It's a slowing of the frequency. Uh, the other thing that can cause it is encephalopathy. Now, typically, it's a metabolic encephalopathy. I think I should explain this really quick. Metabolic encephalopathy, because if you have just any general encephalopathy, it's only going to affect maybe small focal areas of the brain or mildly affect the brain in, in some area but not in others. And so in order to get an EEG of slowing down everything, then you're going to need a metabolic cause because it'll reach all of the brain. 
And now, how do you know if it's slowing? There's a rule of eight. So at eight years old, you should have at least eight hertz. Anything less than eight hertz after eight years old is considered abnormal. And so how do you say, well, how do you know it wasn't theta waves? Well, part of that is you look at the amplitude. So you got, so alpha waves are defined by their frequency, but you also look at how high the amplitude is and stuff like that as well. So you can say that, oh, the alpha waves have slowed down. And then just as the general rule of thumb, what I found was that be from ages 1, 3, 5, and 8, you should get a frequency of 5, 6, 7, and 8 hertz. Now we had a slowing of the background. There are actually three types of slowing. So we had background slowing, but there's also intermittent and generalized slowing that you should be familiar with as well because these give you the degree of how, how uh, severe the encephalopathy is. Starting from least severe going down to most severe. Okay, so here's an EEG of background slowing, and what I want to point out is that it's typically in the posterior, so you can see when there's a P, it typically is referring to a posterior segment, but the slowing is going to typically be in the posterior. And if we come up here, we can look at, for example, this, this frontal area, and you can see the small little uh, beta waves going across here, but then if we come down to, say, like a posterior area, and we start to count these, we can count... One, two, three, maybe four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so you have, I mean, this one's one, one example, but we can go through and count all of these. It's going to average out to be less than eight. And you'll see right here where it says that background, uh, the background is slow, the posterior dominant background alpha rhythm is at seven hertz. Now here's intermittent slowing. Intermittent slowing is just basically you have your background slowing and then intermittently you get some more severe slowing right here. Here we have a picture of generalized slowing and now what I want to point out is even though there seems to be some beta activity the overall is we have a lot of slowing going on and this was actually the the weirdest of all the pictures that I found of this, but it was the same color and scheme as the other ones. But typically you're just going to see some generalized slowing in every lead. And you'll see it's defined as polymorphic delta activity in greater than 80% of the recording. And so here's the three all together. Here's background where you have mostly in the posterior leads. Then you have um, intermittent, which you have the background with intermittent craziness. And then you have the generalized, which you can best see this down here, which is like the delta waves. So the very slowest, the 0 0.1 up to 3.9 down here is uh, really easy to see. And it's in 80% of the recordings. Next it said he had myogenic eye movement that was picked up on uh, artifact. Yeah, we talked about that muscle activity produces electricity as well. So that was picked up. Okay, he had vertex waves, sleep spindles, and K-complexes. The sleep spindles and K-complexes, they're created in the thalamus. So that's the first point. They're, they're generated in the thalamus, and they do two things. The first thing is they stop external stimuli from waking you up. The other thing is that they increase memory formation. The vertexes, I didn't find a really great image of this, so I'll, I'll go ahead and describe it. Waves are described by what they look like, their morphology. The vertex, or V waves, they're seen over the vertex of the scalp in stage two sleep. So this is just saying, again, not only the sleep spindles and the K, uh, the K spindles and the sleep uh, fibers, but also the vertexes, all these indicate he was asleep. He was at least in stage two sleep. So the findings said that there was an absence of rhythmic runs of spike and wave activity. Okay, so EEGs are used to, to diagnose seizures. So most of the time, an EEG is used whenever someone is either having a seizure or when someone is in a coma. And so, and of course, those can actually happen at the same time, so that's important to distinguish as well. Uh, but you have specific findings for ictal and interictal um, phases of seizures. So during the ictal, you're going to see like craziness, like I, I didn't go and uh, download a picture of this, but um, you can Google it, just a crazy looking EEG, find, uh, EEG, like every lead is crossing over each other and they're really rapid, sharp wave peaks and stuff like that. 
The interictal is defined by spike wave discharges, continuous spike wave discharges. The problem is this is only found 60% of the time, 60% of patients. So if there's an interictal period, you're not, it's not like finding the spike wave, very specific. Not finding it is not very sensitive, so you, we, you can't really rule anything out. It's just good to note that you didn't see it. Okay, photic stimulation. There's a lot of different ways to stimulate and try to bring on an abnormal EEG if you're suspecting something. Uh, these are non-specific, but they're specific for like if you have a high clinical suspicion for something, you do this various stimulations, and if it brings out the EEG finding that you're suspecting, then that's important, right? So, um, in a coma, responsiveness to stimulation also implies a better prognosis. So if, so if you can like pinch somebody and their EEG lights up, or if you shine light in their face and their EEG has something happening, then that, that responsiveness implies that it's a very light coma. So the deeper the coma, the, the more non-reactive the EEG will become, and it may even show something called burst suppression patterns so if the coma gets really deep. Um, so I'm not going to go into exactly what that is because it wasn't in our findings. But then you, uh, the types of stimulation you should know about are photic stimulation, sleep deprivation, and hyperventilation. So these three types of stimulation are thought to bring on abnormal EEG findings, typically in your awake patient uh, because... Of course, you can't do hyperventilation. Well, you can do hyperventilation if you have like the uh, the um, you know increasing the the rate of the CPAP or something or the BiPAP, yeah, whatever PAP we're using. So the interpretation: mild encephalopathy, noting the slowing of six to seven hertz. And again, it's mild because it's background and it's not intermittent. It's not uh, generalized. It's just background. Glasgow Coma Scale. So this was originally a 14-point scale. It's been updated to a 15-point scale. Some places still use the 14-point uh, system. However, even the, the original institution that created the original Glasgow 14 points, they've updated to using the new 15-point system. It's just better. So this is what it is. We can all see that. I'll let you look at that in the study guide or pause it if you want to. Is basically the point system. It's based on eyes, verbal, and motor, and you can get anywhere up to six points uh, depending on what you're looking at. Here's the interpretation. A score of less than eight, severe. A score between eight to twelve is moderate. A score greater than thirteen is minor. Now I should say that this eight right here is for the, um, is for if you're using the fourteen point system. And you should use 9 to 12 if you're using the 15-point system. Our patient, we're using the 15-point system. He is at a score of 8, so I would say that he is at the severe. Some modifiers include intubation and swollen eyes. If a person's intubated, they can't respond verbally, so you can't really even uh, determine um, those things. So you, typically what you'll put is you'll give them a score of 1 on this, but you'll put like T1. So you'll modify it as a T1 so that you know it's intubated or an IT or something like that. And then with swollen eyes, if their eyes are so swollen that they can't even open their eyes, then that would be another one that you use a modifier and you give them a score of 1, but you put a letter in front of it to say, hey, it was a 1, but we really don't know. Cerebellar blood supply, so we have the superior cerebellar artery, the posterior inferior, and the anterior inferior. So superior, uh, anterior inferior, and then posterior inferior. And you can see from, this is the top view, looking from above down onto it. This is looking from below up to it. These images come from uh, Wikipedia, so and they were uh, labeled for public use. Now what I think is really neat here is that we saw a lesion in our guy right here. It looked like maybe one right here. I'm just doing this from memory so I could be off a little bit. But if you look right here, it's all, all the way down. It's the uh, pica. But right here going down, you're also coming across with the ica. And so if uh, I would say that it would be really hard to say that this is a blood supply issue. Probably something else. It could be a blood supply issue, could be hemorrhage from the pica, could be could be infarction from the pica. Uh, but I would I would tend to think maybe something else. My current guess well I'm not gonna give you my current guess. Ask me in class because I don't want to sound like an idiot on YouTube. 
Babinski slash plantar reflex. This is the same thing according to Wikipedia. Um, and you should have down going and anytime you're over a year old. Uh, some sources say six months, some say four months. But I'm just going to say, I'm just going to be safe and say over a year old. It should be go down going. Our patient had up going on the right side. Typically, this in, in, uh, indicates an upper motor neuron lesion, may also indicate corticospinal tract problems, lesions. Uh, some common causes right here, uh, ALS, brain tumor, or brain injury, meningitis, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, defect or tumor, and stroke. And I think that's the fastest presentation I've ever had. I'm out.